Hey everybody, this is Sheets, and we're going to be going over the UFC Louisville card. And as usual, we're going to be breaking down our videos into three different videos. One, uh, we're going to do our first DFS video today, where we go over pretty much every fight with respect to who the best plays are um, from a DFS perspective. Tomorrow, we're going to do a contrarian betting breakdown, where we kind of analyze where the public is on certain props and uh, figure out which ones are the best ones to fade. Let's put it that way. Um, and then on Saturday morning, hopefully, or late Friday night, we're going to do a, a lineup construction video where all we do is talk about uh, which of those quote unquote good plays are plays we're actually going to want to play in specifically the tournament that tries to win win us the, the big hundred fifty or two hundred thousand uh, dollars. This week could be a hundred thousand dollars, and that's that is essentially the 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 direction of this video as well. I mean, we're talking about these fighters with respect to how well they would behave in this big GPP. We're not really focused too much on cash, but I think you'll see that the analysis can apply to whatever type of GPP or tournament or cash uh, uh, contest you want to play, depending on, again, on, on what your goals are. Um, so let's just get started. First of all, let me say that it is a 14 fight card. And the reason why I emphasize that is that in a full 14 card, 14 fight card, uh, Number one, you need to prioritize upside. It's not going to be enough to get six winners to even become remotely um, competitive for the optimal. Yet, on the other hand, uh, because it's a 14 fight card, you don't have to get too off the board. You know, it's not as if it's an 11 or 12 fight card with multiple five round fights that rates to be really chalky that you're either fighting for a big, a big chop or you got to get so unique that you're playing stuff that has no chance to win. In a 14 fight card, as long as you, you know, pick fighters with upside that when they win, they score well, you don't have to worry as much about getting too kooky and too off the board. Um, but we'll, we'll save that more for the lineup construction video um, once the ownerships are a little more clear. Um, the other thing is that when you do have a 14 fight card, it becomes less important to have the main event. And we're going to get to the main event, but usually, I mean, when you have an 11 or 12 fight card, these, these five round fights just, just are just so much more likely to cash or to, to make the optimal. Just the other week we had the, uh, the coast uh, Strickland fight, actually the, the, the fight stack, both fighters were in the optimal, which doesn't happen all too often. Uh, but uh, in this particular card, 14 fights, only one five round card, a five round fight. So there was a lot of upside to be had. And uh, a lot of underdogs that you could take shots at. It's going to be a really fun GPP card. And if you can get if you can get this right, uh, I think that there's going to be someone, or at least I was going to say someone. I think that the winner is is very likely to be unique, um, if not unique, at least less than five dupes, just for the sheer number of fights and the way these fights rate to play out. Because what's what you're what you have here, and we'll get into more of this. If you look at, at fight odds, the biggest favorite on the whole card is, I think, Brad Katona. And he's only, well, I shouldn't say he's only. So he's minus 600. But after that, everybody's kind of under minus 300. So what happens is, is that DraftKings has to price these things. We don't have to, but they choose to price these things linearly, meaning they, they don't have you know, multiple fighters of the same salary. So they all this becomes is, is which fighter is the most likely to win according to fight odds. They make them usually 95 or 9,600. And then which, which fights rate to be pick them. And you make that as close to 8,100, 8,100 as possible. And then everything else kind of fills in based on win odds. So what happens is, is you're going to have fighters that are not that likely to win that are going to be priced really, really aggressively. I won't say aggressively, just because of the way DraftKings pricing works, you're going to get 9K and up fighters that don't really, you know, that aren't really great DFS plays. Um, and on the other hand, you're going to get a bunch of mid-range fighters that are close to 82, 83, 8400 that might be that, that might be almost as likely to win as some of these $8,900 fighters. So it's going to make for a very, very interesting slate. All right, let's take a look. Um, let's re-rate these by fight number. 
And let's just get started with Tomar versus Dos Santos. So you have um, Puha Tomar, who is an Indian fighter. I think it's the first female Indian fighter, or at least she's marketing herself that way. Coming into fight, uh, Rayanne Amanda, I think, uh, depends on where you look. Uh, Rayanne Amanda Dos Santos. And the issue with this fight is the style uh, problem for Tomar. Um, Tomar is apparently kind of a decent striker, but the, the main hole in her game is her takedown defense. And apparently uh, Rayanne is extremely uh, aggressive with her takedowns. And it's one thing when you have a, a, a someone who's really good at wrestling and another fighter who's kind of okay at, at stop, stopping them. It becomes a battle of whether, you know, uh, the, the wrestler can get the takedowns or not. When you have this situation where one fighter is particularly good with takedowns, but the other one is particularly poor with them, it's a very, very difficult style uh, problem to fade here. Um, so you have uh, Rayanne, her, her win odds minus 300. I mean, it's, it's really not, I mean, it's okay for 9,100. And you look at her inside the distance line, it's actually not that great for 9,100. You're going to have an inside the distance line of plus 135. And at that price, you usually want an inside the distance line of about minus 110. But the problem here is that she rates just because of the style to get plenty of takedowns in her wins. So even if she doesn't get these, get the finish, she can still rack up plenty of points just because of all the, the control time and the takedowns and whatever ground and pound she can crack, you know, rack up as well. Not to mention the fact that you, you combine her takedowns with the, you know, the plus 135 finishing uh, rate, you know, you get that perfect scenario where maybe she gets a round two finish after getting five takedowns and 10, you know, and seven minutes of control time um, and a bunch of ground strikes. This is the type of fighter that can really break the slate in, in, in fine style. So she's going to be a very, very strong, uh, strong play um, in DFS this week. Uh, and Tomar, unfortunately, she's just not, you know, she just doesn't possess that type of upside. I mean, you look at her inside the distance line, it's plus like 700. Um, and as I mentioned, it's not enough to just get the wins this week. You've got to win with upside. The only exception would be is if your opponent is going to be so extremely chalky that the leverage you're going to get from beating that, you know, that opponent kind of supersedes the, the lack of upside. But I think on this particular card, you don't have that situation. I don't think there's going to be one particular fighter. I mean, I don't think that's going to completely stand out over everybody else. So I think they're going to be playing underdogs. It's not, you can't just do it for the, for the leverage. I think you're going to have to, find these underdogs with sufficient upside. And I think Tomar is just not one. So uh, Amanda, we're going to just kind of keep track of who we like here. Amanda, very, very strong. Um, next fight, you have Taylor Lapalus versus Cody Stamen. Um, when my, my children would be applying to colleges, and this was now several years ago, um, you, you would, you would, one of the things that you'd have to decide between is, is whether you want to go to a small school or a big school and there are medium schools as well. And, and, and part of the draws of going to big schools was, listen, they have a lot of resources. The sports are usually really good and all that stuff. Um, but you run the risk of just kind of getting lost, you know, among all the people. And what they used to say is that when you go to these big schools, you want to try to make a big school feel small. Um, and that's the way you can think about some of these big MMA cards or even some big DFS cards in general is tr when, you, when you have so many fights to choose from, try your best to make that school feel small. And if you can find a, just a couple of fights to, to, to kind of, I don't want to say X out in the wrong way, because when you're playing 150 max, you probably don't want to literally X anybody out. You probably want to, you know, uh, just you'll end up getting very little of it anyway. But when you're even playing 20 or 50 or whatever, there are some fights, if you, if you can get rid of them, it's probably really, you know, it's going to help you. Um, and I think this is one of the fights. So Cody Stamen versus Taylor Lapalus. You have just a very, very poor inside the distance line on both sides here. You have Lapless inside is plus 320. I think he's the favorite, you know. So this is a this to me is a clear fade on both sides, only in the most, you know, aggressive lineups where you have other extremely chalky options. Um, are you going to want to play this fight? And as I mentioned, I don't know how many fights are really going to be that chalky. I mean, we're going to get there. I imagine the main event is going to get a bunch of ownership. And that Reese fight 
is probably going to get a bunch of ownership because of uh, that strong inside the distance line. Okay. But aside from that, um, I don't know how much is really going to be that, um, be that chalky anyway. So I think that, that Stamen Lapalus is probably going to be pretty much a cold fade. All right. Eduardo Mora versus Denise Gomes. Um, it, this is one of the rare, you know, female fights that you have two very aggressive fighters on both sides. And both of them have, at least by the eye test, quite a bit of upside with respect to how they can, you know, rack up points. And you have uh, Mora, who is extremely aggressive and goes for all kinds of takedowns. Um, and, and then you have Denise Gomes, who has like two huge knockouts. I mean, she's she is extremely aggressive in her own right. And she has a couple of big time ceiling performances on DraftKings. And this is a fight you probably want to grab here. Um, let's look at the inside of distance line. You have Mora, who's plus 185 inside the distance, which in and of itself is not that is not that great. But first of all, she is only 8,800, which I think makes it okay. But when you when you add in again all the possible takedown upside, I think it makes up for it. I think it makes her just just as good of a play. Maybe not quite as good, but pretty close to um to Reynaldo from earlier. So uh, I think that she's extremely strong. And, and Denise Gomes on the other side, as you just mentioned, like this is this is the this is the uh, the story, right? With 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 this type of card, I mean, you need to have significant upside from your underdogs and and for all your fighters. And Denise Gomes is a perfect example of it. I mean, her inside the distance line is actually kind of weak, but actually that's not true. She's plus two thirty five inside the distance at her price. I mean, you don't even see that that often. At 7,400 at that inside the distance line, she's extremely strong. So both of these fighters, Gomes and Mora, are, are exceptionally live in GPP this week. Okay, you have Daniel Marcos versus uh, John Castaneda. Uh, this is this is a fight you have to respect because of the of the pricing. You know, whenever you have that 8,200 8K price tag, it, it, it you, you have to give it respect because... You know, it, the way lineups just get built, if you could use these mid-range fights, you don't have to take as many shots as these as these big underdog. Um, remember the average, what the average price of every uh of every of the fighters is what 80 is it 8333 or 8666, you know, whatever uh 50,000 divided by six is. Um so 8333. So the more of these you could use, you know, the better. Let's let's just make sure. Yeah, the 8333. Um, so let's take a look at this fight, Castaneda versus um Marcos. The one thing I would say is that uh Castaneda has the has the greater grappling upside between these two. So I think that Marcos, his win condition or his win condition, his playability condition is more based on his his inside the distance line. Where Castaneda, you could you could make a little bit you can make some more excuses for him if he doesn't get a finish. Um, so let's just take a look. Marcos inside plus three fifty. That's just extremely poor. I have to say, Castaneda is inside the distance line is really poor too at plus three sixty five. I I, don't, I wonder if he does really have a tough takedown upside to overcome that. Um, when I was first thinking about this card, I was thinking that maybe Castaneda would be almost a core play because you put his inside the distance line. Excuse me, his takedown upside with his price um it's going to be pretty strong but i have to say again with a 14 fight card you got to be really greedy you know and, and even though he has a chance to get uh oops even though he, even even though he has a chance to get some takedowns it's not like guaranteed right it's not like guaranteed that he's going to go for them so if in fact you know, it ends up a striking battle, then it's a problem for both these guys because they're inside the distance line extremely poor. And Castaneda's inside the distance line is, is really poor. So I don't know if the takedown upside is enough. Um, I originally thought that this is going to be a core fight for me. I, I'm sort of inclined to almost want to fade it now. It's tough to do because of that price model, but uh, I think I'm going to be under on both these guys. All right, Andrew Lee, Montana De La Rosa. Um, this is an uh, again, this is another fight that is an attempt to make a, a big school small, so to speak. And you have both of these fighters with just extremely poor metrics. You have 
Lee inside the distance plus 325 and De La Rosa plus 700. Um, not, neither of that is going to be good enough. You could argue that De La Rosa has more of the takedown upside of the two fighters, but she doesn't really do much with them. You know, she doesn't, she doesn't have a lot of control time. She doesn't really, um, she doesn't really have, um, put a lot of ground and pound or anything like that. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's a tough, it's, it's a tough fight. I, I would probably end up just stone fading this whole thing. Try to make the, uh, what you call it, try to make the, uh, uh, Big card, small, and just kind of move on with it. All right, Brad Katona versus Jesse Butler. Okay, so as I mentioned before, Brad Katona is the biggest, uh, has the biggest price on the card because he's got the best win odds on the card. He's like minus 625, but that's not like the end of the story. You know, just because he's minus 625 doesn't mean he's worth the, whatever, the 90, 9,500, I guess. Okay, the 9,600. That has to come with a decent amount of, of finishing upside. I mean, 9,600 is a rough, a, rough, a rough price tag to pay off. And if you look at his inside the distance line, it's actually extremely poor. I mean, it's uh, Katona inside the distance is plus 160. I mean, that's something that you're really looking for for something that somebody that's like 8,600, not somebody that's 9,600. So uh, but Katona is, is a pretty, pretty clear fade as far as I'm concerned. And Jesse Butler, he unfortunately just doesn't win often enough to be playable. So uh Katone is a fade. And and look, we're we're doing some, we're doing some damage here. Like we're getting rid of some guys. We we started with 28 fighters. We're getting rid of Katona, getting rid of Butler, getting rid of Lee, getting rid of De La Rosa, considering getting rid of Marcus and Castaneda, getting rid of Stamen and Lapalus. And it's 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 helpful because there are some combinations we're gonna want to access. Um, starting with this next fight. So you have Charles Radke versus Carlos Prates. So he is uh, minus 220. And you look at the price tag, 9,200. So here's one of the issues. You know, normally your $9,200 fighters are going to have just much better win odds. And when we even looked at one earlier, we had, who was 9,100 that we just saw? Like Dos Santos, she was minus 300. Okay. She's minus 300 and she has pretty good take that upside of her, uh, pretty good upside on her own um, where you have uh, what's his name? Uh, Prates, who's more expensive. Who's only who's minus 200 to win. Now, again, it's not just about the minus, you know, the, the win odds. So we look at his inside the distance line His inside the distance line is fine. I mean, it's minus 115, which is pretty much what you want from a $9,100 fighter. But the problem is it doesn't really come with a lot of uh, with any takedowns. He's a rangy type fighter. And he, to be quite honest with you, he was not too inspiring in his last fight. And he was, he was kind of keeping range and, and essentially losing to Trevin Giles, who is just not, you know, nobody's really afraid of him. So this is a very, um, this is a very tough favorite to play, honestly. Um, on the other hand, I mean, you have Charles Radke. He is, again, if we have one guy who's kind of poorly priced because of the win odds, then probably the opponent is going to look pretty good, right? Because now you have Radke who's plus 195, and he is uh, 7,000. I mean, even if we knew nothing about his inside the distance line, I mean, that's a damn good price for a 7K for, for a guy with, you know, 33% winning chances. And you look at his inside the distance, I'm pretty sure it's okay, right? Let's see. Radke inside the distance. Boy, I thought it was going to be better than this, like plus 395. Um, he did finish his last fight in kind of fine style. He was a big underdog to Urbina. Totally walked him down, knocked him down twice and toasted him. So, I mean, he does have that in him. And also from what I've heard, he has a good amount of – he does have some wrestling – he hasn't doesn't really show it all too often, but he's got that in him as well. So I don't know. I think the combination of these two things makes Radke a very strong underdog here. Um, so I actually do prefer the Radke side um, of either of these guys. I mean, I think Protest is fine. I mean, I would say he's probably like a break even play, but I think Radke's an extremely strong underdog here. So so this is why, again, you know, 
you got to find these fights to fade so that you can figure out, you know, which of these underdogs or how many of these combinations you want. You know, like definitely like you have to get some goat Denise Gomes, Charles Radke. These are two guys that I think are a part of the the the, the real high upside underdog pool. All right, Ludovic Klein versus Tiago Moises, uh, 7,800. So the price the the pricing again is something you have to respect. Um, let's take a look at the at the inside the distance lines here. I don't think either of them are that great. Um, actually, they're both plus two twenty, which is not bad, you know, for this price. Um, Klein's inside the distance line. Actually, they're both plus two twenty, right? Who's the favorite here? They have Klein as the favorite, which is which is a little surprising to me. Um, but forget that, Moises in addition to his inside the distance line being just as good, I mean, he's the one with the takedown upside, right? I mean, he's the one with the four takedowns, two takedowns, one takedown, whatever. So, I mean, for me, I think that while Klein is perfectly reasonable 8,400, I think Moy says is an extremely strong underdog. Player. I mean, his, his inside the distance line is, is good enough, you know, and, and he's got the takedown upside. I think, I think we're building this kind of pool that we want to get as many combinations of these three, at least such for starters, these three underdogs as possible. All right. Um, moving on, we have Mikhail Baeza versus Pele Soriano, 8,700 and 7,500. Um, let's take a look at the odds. Baeza minus 194. Um, so I think that's probably kind of fair you know you know when i first looked at this card i thought that there was going to be all kinds of mispricing because of the win odds but i guess all these odds have kind of drifted a little bit so i think this is a pretty fair price by Aza soriano at least with respect to just the win odds so we have to analyze these guys just you know as as we normally would like what is their inside the distance line look is where do their inside the distance lines um uh look like um I don't think either of them on either of them have particularly great uh takedown deep, you know, takedown upside. So let's just take a look. Baeza inside, minus 110. Wow. That's you know when, when you look at the at the analysis of the fights, you're not gonna you're not gonna like this because it's being both fighters are coming off of a lot of losses. To to make Baeza a big two to one favorite seems kind of seems pretty brutal here, but this inside the distance line doesn't lie and at this price. It's, it's, it's one to be respected. Um, Soriano inside plus two twenty. Um, that's really not bad either. So again, you have both these fighters with strong enough inside the distance lines that you do want to attack this fight. And again, we, 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 we built ourselves kind of a portfolio of lines we can play because we're kind of at least conceptually Xing out a couple of fights completely, like no lap list, no stamen, no, well, we're starting to we're starting to get to the point where we now want to get rid of Castaneda De La Rosa also. No, Andrea Lee, excuse me, Castaneda Marcos also. No, uh, no uh, Butler, no Katona, right? No, Andrea Lee. We talked about this. Um, so we shall see what happens. Moving up the card, we have, we have, okay, we have, and this is another reason why you have to find some fights to fade. Marquez and Marquez and Reese. It's 8,300, 7,900. And if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> let's look at this inside the distance line. So I'm not, I don't think like I'm, I'm going crazy. Both of these fighters are basically pick them to finish. Um, so when you have this price for both these guys and they're both about even money to finish, this is just, I mean, almost a theoretical lock. I mean, you, you have to play both of these guys in GPPs, you know, and, and as far as which one you play, um, well, let's look at the price. I mean, it's not too much of a difference between these guys. So uh, I guess technically Reese would be the better play because he's cheaper. Um, we'll get into some ways to, you know, to do lineup, some lineup construction, funny business with, with fights like this. I, I guess I'll tell you right away. I mean, if you want, you could take Reese and leave 400 on the table. And what that'll do is for the, for the optimizers that get up to Marquez, um, it'll, it'll confuse them a little bit. 
and it'll get you a little bit more unique because we don't really care about the 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 median projection of either of these guys. All we care about is what they get in their wins because frankly, I mean, half the time they're going to they're gonna finish. So that's really all we care about. So if Marquez, just because he has, you know, kind of I don't know who's gonna have who's gonna look the best, but whoever has the bigger projection uh is gonna be you're gonna get to them in an optimal that leaves 80, 8300 on the table, for example. And if you could play Reese and leave that 400 on the table, you're getting yourself a little bit more unique. But yeah, this fight is kind of a fight. You just have to just kind of kind of blast both sides. Um, so uh, Bruno Fajaya versus Dustin Stolpis. So this one they made a little bit hard because Bruno Fajaya probably has an extremely strong inside the distance line. Uh, this price tag is pretty rough. You know, at, at, at 9,400, you are going to need, I mean, you're really going to need a first round K. I and mean, if not, it, it, the second round KO better come with a bunch of knockdowns. Let's put it that way. Because he's not getting any takedowns here. Let's take a look and see what these odds are. I mean, first of all, his, his regular inside the distance, that better be at least minus 150. Let's see what it is. But hey, inside, yeah, okay. So it's a it's a big boy number, right? It's minus 175 inside. And I bet you even first round is probably 250. Let's see. But hey, in round one, plus 160, that's it? Ah oh, man, I would take a shot at that. This line doesn't exist, by the way. I promise you, if anybody had Fahea plus one eight fifty, they would be pounded. So there's no way this this actually exists. Plus one sixty three sounds a little more uh, sounds a little more reasonable. Um, okay, so Fahea looks like a pretty good play, but better get there in the first round, you know. So uh, definitely a fight you want to kind of target. Uh, on the other hand, you have Stolzfus. So if he wins, it might not be by finish, but it could be by takedowns because that's how he won his last fight. He does have good wrestling. And if Fahey kind of runs out of gas after the first round, that's what's going to happen. Like Stolzfus is going to go for takedowns. And if that happens – you're going to get a pretty good score out of a $6,800 fighter. So uh, I definitely think that, again, both both sides of this fight are extremely strong. I mean, think about this. You have Stolfus. He's only plus 220, and he's under 7K, you know, with takedown upside. Just kind of an elite-level underdog here. So I actually feel in a weird way that Stolfus, again, is kind of the better play because of that. Again, 9,400, you know, he's – Fajaya – I mean, it's not that likely, right? I mean, you look at his his round one prop, like plus 160, I guess that's fine. But even a first round KO doesn't necessarily win, you know? If he doesn't get the quick win bonus and he just gets kind of like a one knockdown win and you get like 105 or something like that, that's not probably going to be good enough at 9,400. So again, uh, you, you want to get yourself enough combinations to scramble these, these different... Um, these different underdogs here. Let's 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 remind ourselves of who these are. So Stolf, let's put put him in here as well. Um, and obviously someone from this Marquez fight. Uh, all right. So then we have just a couple of more, right? Yeah, three more. Raul Rosas Jr. versus Ricky Tercios. Um, I presume that Rosas is going to have a good inside the distance line to accompany his takedown upside. Yep. Well, his inside the distance line is only plus 150. Let's talk about this for a second. He does have a significant amount of takedown upside, though, and that's what he goes for, kind of relentlessly. But, I mean, forgive me, but why is he a better play than Amanda, for example? I mean, her inside the distance line is the same, if not better. And her path to victory is very similar. So I think that that Rosas is maybe because he's a man and people have heard of him. They're more likely to play him than 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 um, than Dos Santos. But I mean, Rosas is ninety three hundred. Dos Santos is ninety one hundred. Um, so I do think Rosas is a good play, but I think that. So Santos is going to be probably a better play. And, and 
who wants to who wants to go down with the ship first fight on the night first fight of the night well again this is one of the things that keeps these types of ownerships low but anyway rosas does look like a strong play and unfortunately the other side of this tercios does not i mean he i think his inside the distance line looks really poor here let's see yeah i mean plus 600 and again we're prioritizing upside here so unless he's got takedown upside which he does not um, he's just going to be a fade. Dominic Reyes versus Dustin Jacoby. You have Jacoby minus 230. Um, price looks about normal. But we'll take a look at the inside the distance line here. And the Jacoby inside plus 150 with no takedown upside. Ah. I mean, that's rough. I mean, I have to say that I'm sort of inclined since since of all these other combinations I want to access, kind of want to close my eyes and fade this one too. Um, now again, Jacoby I think is coming off a first round KO. Was it a Ben Shakui? I think it wasn't if it wasn't that fight, it was the one before. No, he lost to Menafield in his last fight, but um, he did have Kennedy and Jacou, um, um for that. You know, very, very surprising actually first round KO. Um, anyway, Reyes on the other side, I can't imagine he'd be somebody I'd want to play. Look at, let's look at inside. Oops. Look at his, his inside the distance line. And plus 300. Ugh, at 7,200. Ah. It's actually not that bad, but the problem is it's not as good as these others. It's not as good as, as certainly not as good as Reese, but it's not as good as Gomes, um, not as good as Radke. But I don't know. I mean, you want to throw this in? It just doesn't. It doesn't feel like this is the spot. So again, like I'm trying my best to be an aggressive fader. So on this particular card, so you you, I was a gun to my head in the wrong way, but. I wouldn't mind fading this fight here. So Imovov against Cannoneer. So this is a five round fight. Um, and, and that is, is certainly something to be respected. Okay. Um, second. Fix this thing right here. So five round fights, uh, they, they carry with it just so much upside with respect to significant strikes and other other actions, uh, takedowns, whatever, um, where the inside the distance line is just not quite as important. Um, and, and Cannoneer, he is, is, is prone to put up a whole bunch of volume. And Imovov can certainly hang with him. Uh, I think both these fighters can, can rack up points here. Even if there's no finish, I would say almost especially if there's no finish. So even though it's a 14 fight card, it, it's hard to to recommend fading this fight completely. But I don't think you need to lock it in like you do with most with a lot of five round fights because we did we have gone over so many like just high upside plays here that I think that this fight could get there without getting without winning you know without making optimal and again we're getting into more of this when we talk about the um you know winning that 100k specifically but i think that the combination of how popular the five round fight is going to be just because i guess it should be with the, the possibility that so many of these other fights could smash i think i might end up being under on this fight and with respect to who i like the most i mean i really have no opinion here I will say that that Cannoneer has good money line odds, right? I mean, he's only a plus 105 and he's 8,600. I'm assuming 7,600. So I guess he's where the money line is. They're both their inside the distance line, I think, are very similar. I, well, actually, Imbavov is a little better inside the distance, but Imbavov also might have some takedown upside to overcome like those that money line issue. But then again, Cannoneer has that, that volume I talked about. So Look, flip a coin as far as which one of these guys you want to play. But um, I think they're both in play. So what, what does all this mean? Or what, what does this mean to the average? 
what, what this means, a couple of things. Number one, not that you have to do this, but but there, I think there's a pretty good chance that the winner, the optimal, leaves like there's just a, a bunch of money on the table. Okay. Now, I'm not saying you should leave money on the table, but I think at the end of the day, I think that 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 possibility is certainly in the offing. I would also say, as kind of a, a, a um, uh, derivative of that, I think there's a chance that nobody hits the optimal this week because of that. Um, so I would again, I don't usually do this. I think this is this is might be the week to manually X out fighters. I mean, I don't usually do that because of you know I like to use the sims and give everybody a shot, but there's just so many high upside possibilities from other fights that I think fading the Atlapolis fight. And I have to say, I think fading Castaneda now makes more sense. The Castaneda fight, the Lee fight, fade Butler fight, fade the, the, um, whatchamacallit, the, uh, Jacoby fight. And then just, then just scramble the rest and hope you get lucky. <laughs> uh, and listen, it's not as easy as that, but I think that's the way you're supposed to start um on, on this type of card hopefully that helps uh tomorrow we're going to uh do a contrarian betting breakdown and then either tomorrow night or saturday morning we're going to do that line of construction video where i show you guys how to win the 100k or at least try to uh, that'll do it good luck everybody